Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I am joined by my fantastic co host, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. I'm running out of uh, different words to explain how they are. Uh, and today we are joined and are interviewing uh, Colin Harper, uh, head of content and research at Luxatech and ex Bitcoin magazine and Coindesk writer. Uh, how's it going today, man? How are you doing? Doing well, Lawrence. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, always love chatting with you guys. Awesome, and uh, same here. Glad to glad to have you. Uh, as as you will uh, know, as a as a journalist, uh, I you know I'm here for the hard hitting, serious questions. So for the first question, I want to ask you. This is one that I know all of our listeners will be desperate to to know the answer to. Uh, what is your hair routine? <laughs> oh man, just absolutely putting me on blast immediately. You expect nothing less from a bloke from the UK, eh? um so uh yeah i mean you know just uh shampoo conditioner uh you know make sure only do it a few times a day or a few times a week uh make sure comb it every single time that you condition it uh my fiance has been invaluable for this i had like terrible hair uh care before i started dating her and like i still had the long hair too right so like unless i was like you know i don't know sometimes it was a little nappy and stuff like that but I was also living in Tennessee back then. You kind of get away with it because there's so much humidity. My hair would just like blow up in the summers. But yeah, it's um yeah, that's no, cool. I mean, as someone who's growing my hair out as well, you know, I just uh, I noticed the 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 flowing locks when we were in El Salvador. So uh, had to you know drop the question. So you heard it here first, everyone. Um, this is Colin's hair routine, uh, world exclusive. Uh, but yeah, beyond uh, beyond that uh, question, I'll, I'll move on. What I guess something that we, we had a Twitter Spaces probably I don't know last year at some point back when I liked Twitter Spaces. Um, <laughs> so for anyone who's, who listened to that, it might be covering old ground a little bit. But I wanted to, for the sake of people listening, uh, it'd, it'd be good to understand uh, like your background. So like the, the the easy question to ask here is like, how did you get into how did you get into Bitcoin? And you could be quick about it, obviously because I know it's probably something you've explained quite a few times now but how did you get into bitcoin and like how did you find yourself kind of getting into writing like bitcoin and crypto journalism yeah so i'll try to be quick with it um but i had always known what bitcoin was strangely enough um like my friend from in high school like the year it came out was trying to explain to me how mining worked um i was in high, i was a fucking freshman like no concept of uh, what any of this stuff was, didn't care about what money was, you know, just had no cares in the world, right? Just had, didn't, didn't care about it. Uh, knew, knew that some buddies uh, bought drugs uh, on the dark web with it in college. Um, so like always like come popping back up in my life in some ways. And so like, there's always this like realizations like this thing's never gone away. And I don't really understand what it is. I just know that it's money that's on the internet and not tied to anything else. Um, and then I got out of school in 2017 I graduated I was an English literature major I was trying to figure out what to do trying to figure out if I wanted to teach go back to school if I wanted to write edit something if I wanted to do journalism um and then uh, I was scrolling Facebook one day and this random dude like posted this absolutely fr like frantic frenetic post where it's like you could earn x amount of dollars like 100 200 300 dollars a day by mining bitcoin and altcoins and um, I uh, was like, oh, like shit. It was the first time I'd seen like real money really kind of associated with it outside of like vague prices that tend to be back in the day, right? Like one Bitcoin, $300 when they were like buying drugs off, the silk, uh, off one of the Silk Road uh, spinoffs. So I looked into it um, and I saw all these altcoins and all of this shit. And I just absolutely got sucked into the candy store. It was like bought all the crap. Um, I started writing for some um, some websites that would do like, you know, just like reviews of wallets or guides and just general crypto stuff. I, I didn't know anything. Um, <laughs> I didn't know anything. And I met the Bitcoin Magazine folks at a conference. They had an office in Nashville. I was living in Nashville at the time. And one thing led to another. I got a job there and just kind of just kept writing about it. And that's when really, like a really Bitcoin kind of made more sense to me than other things. Like I really started actually looking into the applications, how people were using it, what it's for, what it does. Um, and uh, ironically is the last thing I'll say about it. Like mining was the thing that su sucked me back in kind of when I saw that post on Facebook from this random dude and this like, you know, Discord, you know, this, um, uh, uh, this like you know, marketplace page. And now I'm working for a mining company um, and 
mining was always something that was fascinating to me, but it was never accessible back in the day. So something that you kind of involved in from early on, and then you found yourself working working more into it as you kind of, yeah, as you said, met back Bitcoin Magazine guys, and you got more involved in shit coins, et cetera, at the beginning, and then kind of worked your way up. Um, so I suppose it, it sounds like from what you said that you were uh, getting a little bit like uh, tired, potentially tired, of, a little bit tired of it, or a little bit kind of, I don't know, uh, sick of it until you then kind of had the opportunity to then go more into mining is that right i I don't want to be putting words in your mouth um no i think that just like um what i would say is like i don't think i really fully understood what the point of a blockchain was until i started working at bitcoin magazine right like i don't think like um the the whole like i would read early on um about like the double spinning problem or you know things like that and it just you know i think this is true for a lot of people in like privileged financial uh economies it's like it doesn't it's like, what do you mean? Like, so the money, like I, like I can spend the money without anyone telling me I can't, and that like no one can, um, you know, inflate the money supply, and no one can make fraudulent, uh, you know, Bitcoin. Uh, it, it to me, it was like, okay, like that's all right, I guess, but I don't really, you know, like that doesn't make that doesn't matter for me. I just want to make money, right? Um, and so uh, when I started working at Bitcoin Magazine, started working with Anna Van Weerdom, started reporting on some of the use cases. It was like, oh, I see. This is money for a completely, uh, uh, th- this is money for a new paradigm for how we exchange value and how we view holding value and how we view how you can custody that value and move it around in an age with, uh, you know, uh, internet infrastructure everywhere. So um, I, uh, I, I was getting sick of, I think what you might have also been referring to um, when, in our space is I was getting tired of journalism. Um, I was getting tired of crypto journalism because I think that there's this problem and um, this is just journalism at large, but it, it especially is um, a, a problem for a cryptocurrency because it's such an abstruse topic and so hard for people to understand. So it's much easier to just go for the pulp. Um, so uh, I, I got tired of having to report on things that were just keyword, uh, you know, cows. This is like kind of what I guess I would call them. It's just like, fat, you know, articles with just fat keywords that are going to get searched a bunch in Google, like Dogecoin's a perfect example. And so um, some of the, my, some of the days when I was doing that, I'd love it. You know, I'd be writing stuff that really actually was breaking news and advancing conversations on things that I felt like mattered. Um, and then there were other days where it's like, hey, Colin, you need to write this article about Dogecoin. And it's like, I don't, that just doesn't, it doesn't like that's the kind of shit that I did in 2018 when I in 2017 when I didn't understand any of this stuff. Like I don't want to do that anymore. Um, I wanted to be more industry facing, so I went mining. Sorry, kind of rambling, making it a little more about me. But um, anyway, oh, that that answers the question, man. Like perfectly, because I, I yeah, I was kind of hinting at both periods, but that definitely was one of the things. Because I remember, yeah, when we spoke, I remember there was a slight sort of slight hint of like, oh, kind of a little bit sick of <laughs> sick of this kind of thing, and. Yeah. Um, and I remember, um, and, and I suppose it, I think it's not a surprise either, because if you do something for a long time, especially if it's writing about something you're not necessarily passionate about some of the time, then you're going to get pretty bored of it. And I even though like for myself, I've had to take like a month or so off Twitter before and like, you know, take breaks from checking prices and things like that. Cause I just get, sometimes I get a bit sick of it. Mm-hmm. Like I'll get super, super, super into things. I'll be making a lightning ATM. I'll be doing this, going to this meetup. And then I start thinking like, geez, like I'm kind of sick of talking about Bitcoin now. Like this, <laughs> like yeah, I kind you of get, get fed up with it. <laughs> you get sucked into this bubble, right? Like it's its own, it's its own world, it's its own microcosm. Um, and I think that it's something to that Bitcoiners need to remember, right? It's like we need to be careful not to be too dogmatic. Um, I know that usually a lot of Bitcoiners are very principled and they are very, um, you know, they have a sense of a mission and they feel like something needs to be done. Um, but sometimes I think you can get a little too tribal, just like with everything. I mean, uh, we see this and everything else. I think human beings scramble for meaning in their lives and they attach to certain externalities, like whether it be politics, religion, uh, some sort of lifestyle. And I think Bitcoin is like that too. So it's good to kind of like kind of step out and have that perspective every now and again, because I totally agree with you. Like there have been times where it's just like, I was like so deep in it and it's just like, talking about it all the time with my friends and family and they're just like dude shut up <laughs> like we don't care you know it's like it's sometimes you feel like the messiah on the hill you know being like like you're all gonna fucking lose your money unless you adopt this thing you know and you know we don't know that ultimately i mean we think that but um 
yeah, I uh, I love I love the Bitcoin community though. I've never had the I was thinking about this uh, the other day. You know, um, the internet really opened up the potential for people to communicate all around the world. I mean, like with 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 my Bitcoin magazine job, I'd be talking to people from all around the world all the time, and the internet makes that possible uh, through email and instant messaging. And what a beautiful thing to have Bitcoin, right? Now we have the monetary side of that, right? Like we had like the actual like information side with the internet and now we have the monetary side. Um, and I think it's very um, fitting that Bitcoin's community is so global. I mean, look at like who we have on this call right now, right? Um, we've got people representing, I assume, I mean, people from um, four different continents, right? Like that's, that's, that's yeah. a pretty special thing. You don't really see that very often. I feel like in many industries, um, I mean, you do in big, big multinational and global ones, but like every small company in Bitcoin has like at least two nationalities represented, right? Um, I was super anxious to hear about the mining industry. Um, I also worked as a journalist and I'm super curious about mining and you've kind of transitioned into that full time. So I'd love to get your take on it. Yeah, is there any like a uh, topic is there a lot of different angles? Is there anything like specifically you were thinking well, about? Well, um, we, we interviewed um, Econo Alchemist on Twitter, uh, Burn the Bridge, about mm -hmm. home mining. And he kind of mm -hmm. gave us a glimpse into people mining at home and, and decentralizing the network and, and self custodying your Bitcoin and stuff. We talked to Charlie Schumacher from Marathon, which is like publicly yeah, traded mining, huge, large yeah, scale right. enterprise. Just like total in other ends of the spectrum, right? I think that's yeah. really an interesting, um, so maybe I'll just riff on that for a second. I mean, I think that's really an interesting dichotomy, right? Like, so at Luxor, the company that I work at, we've devised a metric called hash price. Um, and that's a way to measure value of your computing power, your hash rate for Bitcoin, right? So it's like, um, you measure it and you can measure it in dollars or sats and you basically take a Terra hash, which is, a, you know, like a S19, one of the newest miners, just for our listeners, produces 100 Terra hash. So if the hash price is 16 cents per Terra hash, which is as today, you could expect to make like $16 in revenue for that machine um, over the course of a day. Um, if you're mining with like a, um, with, with, with a mining pool. So it's with specific mining pools like Luxor that do FPPS. Um, but uh, so uh, before like the last bull market, like hash price was like dirt cheap. It was like six, six, seven cents, like right before Bitcoin kicked off in 2020. Um, and last year it tapped out at like 41 cents, which is like, so people were just absolutely crushing it. Home mining was back in fashion. Um, and it was also compounded by the fact that you had China banning mining, right? So you had all of these machines. Um, the mining industry has historically been concentrated in China like on, on I, pretty much every vertical, um, except really the financial. Like that's one place that the United States has excelled in, in, in creating financial infrastructure for cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. Um, early on, um, China had mining pools, the manufacturing for ASICs, um, bunch of power, all this stuff. So they kind of had that market cornered. Um, it's harder for North American companies to get ASICs. Um, the Chinese and Asian partners would always get preferential treatment. Um, and then China bans mining, and then all these machines come over to the United States. So you started seeing a lot of people like as, with more interest in Bitcoin. Like, as Bitcoin went through this kind of like hype cycle again, more people came in. And I, I would run spaces, and there would be a lot of people who were totally new to Bitcoin, but they were mining with like Compass, or they were like buying machines for their house. And that was not really a thing that people did last cycle. Like, I, I mean, some did for sure. Some people tried and thought about doing it, but it was too hard logistically. Like there was no way for them to get machines um, unless they really knew someone. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, I, I'm a, what I'm a little worried about is like, so now you have hash price dropping, like it went from like 40 cents to now it's at like 16 or 17 cents. So like mining profitability is getting squeezed really hard right now. Um, most home miners, unless they have new generation machines, you're not going to be breaking it even unless they have super cheap power. Um, you're going to really have to know what you're doing. I think a lot of people probably dove into it last year and they don't really probably have not thought that much about the economics of it or like mining is extremely complicated. Like it's not as simple as just buying the machine and plugging it in. Like you got to make sure your house is wired. You got to make sure that you have, um, airflow or something to make sure the miner doesn't get overheated. You gotta make sure that you're doing something to expel the waste heat. You gotta make sure that you're keeping the miner like uh, dust free and free from things that would clog up the fans. 
Um, and you got all these big pub companies that are coming in and they're going to start turning on just thousands of machines. So Bitcoin's hash rate's probably gonna hit like, it's like at 210 exahashes right now. Um, it's probably gonna hit somewhere like 300, 320 by the end of this year. Um, that's like, I would say like 280 is conservative, 330 would be um, liberal and somewhere in the middle of that. And so once that happens, unless Bitcoin's price keeps up, um, it's going to be not. It's going to be um, extremely uh, difficult for people with higher electricity prices to keep their machines on, because the more Bitcoin's hash rate goes up, the more difficulty goes up, the less you're making per block reward for the unit of energy you're putting in. So um, I guess my take on mining right now, it's been an extremely exciting year after the China ban. Um, the United States and North America and and Latin America too. Like Latin America is really starting to see some some investment and growth in mining. Um, just like the, 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 the Western hemisphere is having this kind of like renaissance with the mining industry. And it's really, really great. Um, I just hope that Bitcoin's price can, will keep up with uh, some of the hash rate growth because if not, then it's um, a lot of people are gonna get burned and it's gonna leave some sour taste in some investors' mouths. Yeah, uh, I know we have, um, as you gotta mention, we've had a couple of uh, mining guests, um, guests from the mining industry. Um, we did have um, um, Charles Skomaka from Marathon Digital Holdings, and he did mention something. He said that, um, or he predicted rather that, he predicts that uh, in the next uh, probably you know, two decades that the mining industry would be would see lots of um, we would see lots of you know power companies actively mining, you know, getting involved in Bitcoin mining. How do you agree with that statement? Have you had, you know, any, have you heard, you know, anything in that regard? So I know that um, there was some news that came out. So first of all, I agree with that. I think that it's a no brainer that eventually you'll have power companies and utilities mining Bitcoin. Um, it just makes economic sense for them. Um, and I'll explain a little bit why in a second, but some of the developments we've seen, um, I think Mackenzie Sigalos, CNBC reporter on this, Conoco Phillips, like one of the largest oil producers in the world. Um, they've started, I think, letting Bitcoin miners come onto some of their sites and like mine flared gas. I could be wrong about exactly what the relationship is there, but like they have exposure to Bitcoin mining somehow at this point. Like it is part of their revenue streams. And I think that that like, and so like there are a bunch of different models you could do here, right? Um, like if an energy producer is going to mine, like, are they just going to let the miners come on and then take a cut? Like, you know, just kind of do like a hosting co-location model. Cause like, or sorry, not co-location model, just do kind of like a, let them do their thing. Um, cause that's one way to do it. They could also just buy the miners themselves and keep all of the profit. Um, and I think you'll have a mixture of these different, like they'll have, some of them will have joint ventures with miners. Some of them will just do mining outright. Um, but I think it is inevitable. And the reason is like, especially if you consider, so like, let's just say that you're a, um, let's say that you're like you're a utilities provider um, in like a, a large city in America or something. Um, and you have like, you have to budget for like a hundred megawatts of demand during any given day. Um, a lot of the time, like you'll probably only, the city will only produce like 50 megawatts of that, right? Um, so you're overproducing by 50%. Sometimes they'll produce, they'll, they'll consume 75 megawatts of that power. Sometimes they'll consume under 50 megawatts. Um, what Bitcoin mining allows these companies to do is the times that they overproduce and the grid is not consuming that energy, they can absorb that with Bitcoin mining and create profit on top of what was otherwise just completely wasted energy. So they can actually create revenue out of something that otherwise would have completely gone to waste. Um, and, um, and the good thing about this is I wrote about this for Hashrate and X's newsletter a few weeks ago. You're kind of starting to see in Texas how this can be beneficial um, because you know when the grid is going to need that energy that the miners are using, these miners are starting to shut down. Like um, when, what Riot's Windstone uh, facility, huge facility in Rockdale, Texas, shut down for like a week during some winter storms. Um, Core Scientific shut down some of its facilities in South Dakota this winter too during some winter storms. And what that allows you to do is, is you can basically, um, like for every megawatt of energy that the energy company or utility company can create, Bitcoin mines can absorb 
some of that energy, right? So you could basically say like this, this energy company creates hundred megawatts of energy um, and the Bitcoin mining uh, farm is gonna consume like 20 megawatts of that, right? And then, but it's, here's the thing is it's variable. You can take that energy back when you need it. So you can earn money from these Bitcoin miners when you don't need that energy. And when you do need it, you just use it and provide it to the grid in, in any way. Um, and uh, this is kind of what people have been talking a lot about this, like power curtailing and like um, controllable load resources for Bitcoin, uh, like Bitcoin miners acting as that for the grid. It's a very complex topic that I honestly don't know enough about it. To, I wrote like very shallow on it. And I don't, what well, a dude from like, uh, his name is Blake King. He works at a, for a solar company. He like messaged me um, on, on LinkedIn, I like hit him back. And he was saying how like the definition is like very technical, but uh, if Bitcoin miners act as a controllable load resource, basically what they can do is, is they power down or up when the, when the, the power authority needs them to. And this is a pretty novel this is a pretty cool thing, right? Because you can basically build out additional power capacity when you necessarily wouldn't have the demand from the grid, right? So this means that like future energy projects can actually over budget for power creation because they're gonna have someone, i.e. Bitcoin miners to absorb that excess power. And then that profit can then be used to invest or incentivize additional energy sources and things like that. Um, and to kind of tie this back in, uh, Jerry, to your original thing, I do think power companies eventually will just, it's going to, they're going to do it. It just makes economic sense. And because of that, like, you know, compound that with Bitcoin's uh, declining block subsidy in 10 or 20 years, it's going to be very hard to mine unless you have, I mean, it's basically going to be like producing oil today, right? Like you're going to have to have a shit ton of capital you're going to have to have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, capital backing you so that you can build out massive operations to really extract bulk amounts of you know like really have a bunch of hash rate because like the more you're going to actually be able the more bitcoin you're going to be able to mine the more you're going to be able to actually extract profit when you're only making like one bitcoin per block right i guess like my concern definitely is like as you say when we get this um this uh hash rate concentration and like the ability for only like huge investors in mining to be able to mine then you're obviously going to reduce the amount of people or people in control mining i suppose at least so then you do come into the risk of like hey if we've got i don't know a hundred different huge companies around the world that are mining that's a hundred different huge companies that could be targeted by anyone or governments or whatever or could collaborate to sense the transactions and kind of make bitcoin not what it was supposed to be in the first place um so it's kind of i, I guess that then then becomes yeah i guess that then becomes like you know if, if we had it like that i guess are there going to be groups of people who are, don't care if it's profitable or not and are just for the sake of keeping the bitcoin network what it is going to still just home mine right like a kind of alchemist who we had on here for example yeah i think so i think you'll still have clubs who want to just earn like you know sats that are like you know freshly minted kyc free um they want to feel like they're they want to feel like they're a part of the network and securing it they want to also get uh, uh satoshis that they don't have to buy from an exchange but ultimately i think that that hash rate will be so minimal um that i don't think uh, I, I don't think it'll factor in too much but i think the good thing is, is i really do think that you'll see global uh energy companies and um, global or just companies in general kind of tap into Bitcoin and mine. I, I think it'll always be a global thing. I mean, like, look, you have um, a lot of like, even when electricity is really expensive, like if electricity is expensive in the United States or Canada and Bitcoin goes down um, and less miners are making money, um, the miners in places like Latin America, like Venezuela, who are mining for like sub one cent are going to start making more money um uh that that's that might kind of seem like a tangent but i guess my point in saying that is like it's such a fluid thing like the the mining profitability is always changing um the the pieces on the board are always changing i mean just a few weeks ago or just a few months ago kazakhstan was one of the largest mining hubs now they can't get their grid together you know, and now miners are leaving because the government has basically scapegoated them and said, you're the reason our grid is shit. And it's not true, but they're leaving the country anyway. 
Um, uh, yeah, so I also think another good thing here too, um, mining concentration, obviously not good. We want as much distributed mining as possible. I really do think that ultimately it, it will be more globally distributed. I don't think the United States and Canada will be 50% of the hash rate forever. Um, but uh, the, the, the good thing is too, this is why nodes exist. This is why Bitcoin is such a beautiful, uh, beautiful machine. Um, ultimately, if you run your own node, you don't really have much to worry about. And it's not totally true because it's more complicated than that. Like the market also has to decide that the coin that you choose to support is the coin that is the most valuable one. So um, but there's kind of a, a threat of that too, I guess, to your point, Lawrence. But um, I, I think that mining will ultimately be extremely distributed just because the incentives are too, are too great for a lot of these, especially multinational companies and uh, energy producers. Yeah, I guess it's like they, they they know what happens if they mess up and end up having things too concentrated. Suddenly, your entire business model is destroyed within a day or something. Essentially, if there's like a right. bomb attack because you guys have colluded, um, so it seems pretty stupid uh, if you're going to do it on purpose. Um, mm -hmm. I guess like a, a more specific question to to what you're up to now, um, like following your move uh, into the mining industry. Like obviously you're working with Luxatech and uh, looking at Luxatech, it's my, what 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 you guys do is is there's a mining pool, hash rate index, and Viridi funds. Uh, what the hell is a Viridi fund? Uh, so Viridi is like uh, we. I guess I don't know how to explain our relationship with Viridi. Um, I guess we, we technically sponsor the fund, so like we're involved in it, but we don't technically manage it. Um, like we we're, we're, we're hands off in terms of actually like any sort of allocation or things like that. Like that's totally up to them. But so Veridi funds is just like a Bitcoin mining ETF. So um, it's got a really long technical name because the SEC like forces you to do all this bullshit when you're filing for an ETF. Like it's like the Veridi um, clean energy and semiconductor ETF because it's got like some shares of TSMC in there and uh, a bunch of other Bitcoin miners. But so yeah, it's just a basket. Um, and uh, there's like that one. And then I think, um, what is it? Um, Valkyrie just came out with a Bitcoin mining ETF as well. Um, yeah, so. tickers wag me. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, we all gonna make it. Yeah, it is. That's, <laughs> I mean, like the, the, the meme signal is strong. I, I think it's hilarious how brazen some, some companies are in this industry. Um, That's but, true. Yeah, so, um, but in Luxor in general, yeah, we're a mining pool. We also broker ASICs um, and uh, we got hash rate index, which is like what I kind of oversee, uh, which, you know, data and research for Bitcoin mining. When you guys say you broker ASICs, do you guys um, like run them for people or do you just sell them? Like, no, we don't, we don't run them. them. We don't host. Yeah, we just like match sellers and buyers. Um, and uh, which is something that we did, just started doing this past year because, again, like because of the mining ban. There's just so many, I mean, like imagine to kind of like get, put this into perspective for people, like there were millions of ASICs in China, like, you know, like anywhere from like one to three, um, more machines than that, if you count all the different types of mining. But like, so you would have farms where it's just like, they just shut down like 20,000 machines and they'd be like, where are we going to put these? Like, where are these going to go? And you had that happening all across the country. So um, it really opened up uh, a lot of business opportunities for a lot of Bitcoin miners in North America. Um, and also like, and, and just in, and again, in the Western hemisphere in general. Uh, but yeah, so if anyone has any need for some ASICs, uh, hit us up. I, from late last year, um, El Salvador, you know, they announced that they were going to launch Bitcoin City and it was going to be powered by geothermal energy. Um, does uh, Lexor have, do they have any intention to actually leverage, you know, for the, you know, any sort of partnership they intend to go into with the El Salvador government, you know, in regards to that? Yeah, we tried. Um, we really tried to, I think most every mining company in, in the world tried to get their foot in the door. Um, we tried, but um, I don't know. So I know they're working pretty closely with Blockstream. Um, and I think Blockstream is probably going to be the partner that they use for most of their mining stuff. Um, Blockstream will probably help them with getting, has probably helped them with getting the ASICs, uh, probably are helping them. I just don't know what pool they're using. That's like the only thing that I don't know and I would like to. Um, there are rumors that they're using slush, but I don't think that that's true. 
um, because like when Bukele tweeted like their first payout, the way Slush's payout system works, I don't like that the, they wouldn't have been able to have received it yet. Like it was below Slush's threshold and they hadn't been mining long enough to receive one. So um, I'd be curious to know who they're using there. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that whole thing develops too, because um, I, I don't know enough about geothermal. Apparently, like they're it's extremely expensive to like start, but once you like get one going, it's like so low cost. So this could be extremely beneficial if they actually do it right. I'm inclined to think that they will because the Blockstream team is very confident in basically everything that they do. Did you see the article about the new miner? Um, Ace yeah. Supposedly yeah. has like 400 terahash. Yeah. What's your opinion on that? Man, that's weird, dude. Because it's not, it's not, it's not 440 terahash. Like it's just, you know, um, they were claiming it was like 440 terahash and I think like 8,800 watts. And, and that that's just like insane. Um, that's uh, better than anything Bitmain is putting out right now. Um, except for, I guess, the XP, but even then. So, yeah, I don't think it's real. Um, like, they, if you look at some of, like, this marketing stuff, like, they literally lifted the design for the miner from, like, some computing company's desktop or something like that. And, like, the yeah, the company acknowledged it, right? But what's really weird about it is, it's, like, the company that, like, so, like, the reason why everyone, um, and we tweeted about it at Hash Rate Index. I actually tweeted about it at the time. Um, uh, joking around and it got a lot of traction and I was just like oh fuck guys like this thing is not real um but uh the the weird thing is is like the company that like signed an agreement to buy them Griffin is like merging with this company called uh Sphere 3D or something I think anyway they're going public this year um on the Nasdaq I think it's either the Nasdaq or the NYC um the or, uh, or, or or the new york stock exchange but um they're going like it's going public and like griffin's like a big mining company and they just like purchased or like signed an agreement to sell stock and to buy with cash like millions of dollars worth of these miners and it doesn't make any sense like if you're like a professional mining company like you would like that means that they signed these papers before they actually saw a working prototype and tested. That's insane to me, right? Um, for like a new miner to come in and say, we have a machine that produces 440 terahash, like class leading efficiency and class leading performance and you don't see it and you buy it. So yeah, I don't think it's real and I don't really know what Griffin's doing. Um, I, I just hope that there's a way for them to renege that because if not, then it's gonna be brutal for them. Another player that I saw entering the mining industry is Intel. What's your take on Intel uh, making a large move into producing ASICs? I am super excited about Intel coming in. Um, I think it's going to be very good for, so going back to like China kind of dominating the mining industry, the only reliable, like the only large scale ASIC manufacturers in the world are, are Chinese companies. Um, like Bitmain and, and what's my and MicroBT are the two largest, Bitmain by far the largest. MicroBT, not a very close second. You know, Bitmain probably has like 50% market share, micro 50, 60, MicroBT 30, 40. Um, and then you have uh, Kanan, and then you kind of have InnoSilicon, but they don't, they're, they're kind of the, 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 the runt of the litter there. Um, and then you have a few others, uh, but, 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 but basically all of them are in China. Um, and you have some in the United States that are trying to do it, like Epic and now Blockstream. But Intel is coming out and they're going to have a product ready this year. I think that's what makes me most excited about it is like we're going to see that machine unless supply chain stuff messes up, messes it up. We're going to see it come out this year. Um, I'm actually writing about it for Ashford and Nexus newsletter. Uh, I'm going to pub it actually after this podcast, probably. Um, so a little inside scoop before we uh, before we post it. But um the uh, the stuff that was reported on earlier this week, like in, uh, Intel presented at a conference called ISSCC. It's like some semiconductor conference. And the specs for it were basically that of miners that were coming out three years ago. And so a bunch of people were on Twitter being like, oh, Intel is like, this is all they got. This is going to be terrible. This is not going to be competitive. But the actual miner is going to be very competitive if, if public filings from one of Intel's customers are to be believed. 
Um, it, it looks like it's gonna be like 135 terahash and have pretty good uh, energy efficiency too, like lower than some of the newest generation ASICs. And when I say energy efficiency, I mean like how many, how much hash rate a miner is producing per unit of energy. So we measure it in joules per terahash and joules there is, 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 uh, is um, you, you can replace joules with watts there. So like if your machine produces a hundred uh, terahashes and it consumes 3000 watts, then your, then your machine produces 30 uh, or consumes 30 watts per terahash. And so Intel's new ASIC is gonna be like 21 watts per terahash, which is like lower, which is like lower than, I think it's like comparable with like Bitmain's miner that's coming out later this year, the S9 XT, S19 XP. So um, it'll be super good. I just wanna see how many they can produce this first round. I think that's really just the biggest question. Um, like Bitcoin miners are on the lowest, they're basically like in terms of like semiconductor uh, clients, they're gonna be the last people to get uh, chip allocation, right? Like, so like um, computer companies, um, so, uh, cell phone companies, car companies, uh, general appliance companies, they're gonna be the uh, clients that get first priority from like TSMC and some of these other chip manufacturers. Same thing with Intel, they're going to only allocate a certain amount of chips for this, not their like, you know, computers and things like that. So um, anyway, it'll be interesting to see actually how many they can produce um, and, and how much of it actually spills over into the resale market. Because right now, like grid infrastructure, which is a pretty big, they're, they're going public soon, if they're not already public, they're a big miner. Uh, Block, formerly Square, Jack Dorsey's company is a customer in Argo blockchain. All of these are big companies, they're gonna get the first dibs. And they're not going to sell the machines, right? Like they're buying them, they're going to plug them in, and they're going to run them for as long as they can. So it's going to be probably take a while before these machines hit the resale market, and a lot of North American miners, besides the big guys, can start playing with them. I'm just excited to see something kind of produced um, from a North American company with Bitcoin ASICs, though. The last question is though, it's like, and I don't really totally know the answer to this. It's like, are all the machines, are all the chips Intel's chips, or are they buying five nanometer chips from TSMC? I think they're probably doing the latter if their machines are going to be this competitive. I've actually heard that that Intel has their own foundries. I'm not an expert by any means, but I've heard that that's what separates them from AMD is that AMD has to buy chips from a foundry, whereas Intel has their own foundries. That's that's 100%. And as far as I know, Intel's foundries currently produce like seven nanometer chips. Um, and the lower the nanometer, the more efficient. And I think... Like the most uh, new, new, new gen ASICs use five nanometer. And I think that they probably, unless they found a way around it, they probably are using five nanometer from another place too. But um, uh, anyway, TLDR, positive thing for the industry. I think for the next two years, you're going to see a lot of ASIC. It's going to be great. You're going to see a lot of new ASIC manufacturers come into play, like Blockstream, um, Intel, stuff like that. Um, some other companies come into fruition. Uh, and I think that that's just going to really help just drive down prices of ASICs, make them more available and be a little more competitive. Um, but I do also wonder, again, the thing is, like, there are only so many chips that they're going to allocate towards the mining industry. So if Intel starts, you know, actually using their own chips for this, then that's going to be really good because now you have another semiconductor manufacturer actually producing chips for the ASICs themselves. Um, and that just, you know, will actually free up supply, hopefully driving down costs. I mean, I know there's not like a huge amount of um, people making uh, like my, you've got like the ant miner, you've got like, there's only a few different companies, right? And obviously Intel stepping mm -hmm. in. Do you think in the future, um, do you think we'll see like um, an, a massive expansion of the market of like different miners and you'll have miners that will appeal to like different situations? You'll have like companies that will be best at making miners for hot climates, ones that have better liquid cooling, ones that are better for this and that. Do you think it's going to turn into this kind of like, oh yeah, okay, you're in this country, you probably should go for that miner or oh, you're like a homebrew kind of guy, go for that one or, you know, there's going to be so like different kind of categories. So to your last point there, I think that like the homebrew thing, I think that's where the distinction would come. I don't think it would necessarily be region specific, but it's like, what are you trying to do for your mining operation, right? Like I think eventually in the future, you'll have companies and like Bitmain's already kind of used to do this with some racks they would build, but like you'll have like big miners who are buying like, you know, basically literally like a rack with like five different computers on it. That's like, you know, 2000 terahash 
for the whole rack, right? And then you'll have companies um, that are making, you know, less powerful, less, maybe more efficient, or maybe less efficient, depending on how it works out or which chips they use, but like less powerful miners for home miners, right? Just for guys who want to just have like something that they can just run, make a little passive income. Um, one thing that I do think that will probably happen eventually, and I just don't know who's going to do it, but eventually someone's going to put an ASIC into like a water heater or they're going to like put an ASIC into like a home furnace because basically you can just recycle the waste heat from these things, especially the more powerful ones, use it to heat your home, use it to heat your water line, all of these things, and you're making money on that. Like, like you're literally like making money to produce heat that you then use in your house. So you can kind of like neutralize your utility bill if you can figure out a way to recycle that properly and in a way that it's efficient. And I think that products like that, you know, I don't know if they'll ever be huge. Some Bitcoin miners are going to be like, every home's going to have an, some Bitcoin miners are like, every home's going to have an ASIC in it in 20 years. So that'd be awesome. I don't think that's true. I think like, people have been saying that for solar panels for like 30 years, right? So it's just like, I think it'll be like something like that, where it'll be like a niche thing. You know, like some people have like rain catchers or like hot water systems that where they're literally heated on the roof of their home. And it's kind of like an efficiency hack thing. And I think some people will make kind of niche kind of boutique products with Bitcoin miners for that, for like heating people's water lines or like their homes and things like that. Um, I would love to see something like that. And I would also love when I have my own house to rig something up like that. Because uh, again, it's just like, that's, that's the thing about Bitcoin mining is like ultimately Bitcoin miners, like, you are going to be more competitive if you can find ways to cut costs or if you can find ways to uh, recycle waste or if you can find ways to reduce inefficiencies. And I mean, man, if you can like heat your house with something that makes you money, that's pretty fucking cool. Yeah, why not, right? Like, um, exactly. That's like when we're talking to Connor Alchemist, then, like one of the things I, I raised was like how people have been quite inventive with like ways to use the heat that's generated by the miners. And there's like this guy who like, set up um something so that it goes from outside and then it like heats like a little like box home for like uh these like kittens that have been like, like these stray kittens and stuff and he's like it's like this just kind of stuff like that's a really cool initiative i like seeing stuff like that like people inventing things around like um the excess heat created by miners um especially for cold climates it can be really useful 100 mm -hmm. if if utilities uh utility companies do come in like to mining and, and they start setting up their own infrastructure do you think then we could possibly see an ASIC in every house, but like they're just harvesting? The, the I, I feel I, I don't know. I don't I don't think so, because I feel like it would require like the like appliances manufacturers to do it. So it's like imagine if like GE just came out with like, you know, like a special purpose like furnace or something that like had an ASIC in it. Like that's what it would probably look like. But I mean, I do think to your point, like utilities getting involved might make it everything advances the conversation and kind of like uh you know um moves the ball forward a little bit right like you know two years three four years ago um politicians talking about bitcoin or like utilities providers or energy providers mining bitcoin probably would have sounded insane to the most to the general population but i think you know that stuff's starting to happen and you're starting to see general acceptance or just like you know people may think that like bitcoin is like not like they're not going to buy it they may think it's overvalued and stuff but they're starting to like say like well it's not really going away kind of like in the same way that like some people will be like oh well, i'm not going to buy tesla stock because it's overvalued but they don't think that tesla is necessarily like a scam company they think they're overvalued but they don't necessarily think that like this is a ponzi scheme right i think we're kind of at that point with bitcoin so you know maybe it's not totally absurd that utilities or uh you know appliances manufacturers start doing stuff like that but um i i uh i think that i don't know it's going to require a lot of orange pilling before we get there uh, waiting for the tv that the smart tv that mines <laughs> right. everything everything mining that's the true uh web you know was it uh, not web free point i what's the thing where it's like uh, we're going to have all the uh all the things like our microwave and everything connected to the internet i can't remember called now Internet of Things. Internet of Things. That's it. The true yeah, Internet of Things. Right. Everything. Everything's a miner. <laughs> it's like uh, you did your washing machine. It's also mining at the same time as washing the clothes. Your your uh, Xbox and PS Five is a miner when you're not yeah. playing. It's just <laughs> hashing away in the background. That's the dream. That, 
that's something that actually kind of does make sense like if you could like program like the gpus on your like consoles to like mine shit coins and then just convert it to bitcoin anyway oh there we this, go this is what happens when you start mining dude you just like things like how can i harness all of the computing power in the world to make hash rate um and back to intel microwave. intel is also coming out with gpus so do you see that as them trying to get into the shitcoin mining market? Oh or man, I that wonder. They're actually just trying to alleviate the su- the supply shortage of GPUs for gamers. Mm, I think it's probably that. I think it's more that. I think they see an opportunity there. Like prices are just inflated. GPU mining is weird because you have like no one in the altcoin industry wants proof of work. Like no one in Ethereum wants proof of work. Very few altcoiners want proof of work. They see proof of work as dirty. They see proof of stake as like new and futuristic and like a good thing. And like proof of work is like boomer coin shit. Um, and so NVIDIA's, um, NVIDIA has a purpose built. Like they, they, they build a GPU just for Ethereum mining. And like HUD 8 bought, bought, a, bought a bunch of them. I think Hive might have two, two big mining companies. But I don't think many people are buying them um, according to what I've heard. Um, or from what I've seen, I feel like I've heard the like sales for those have plunged. And I think that generally it's kind of weird, right? Because at Luxor, like we launched an ETH pool because ETH is like crazy uh, lucrative to mine. It's extremely lucrative to mine, even after EIP 1559 or whatever that was, where they like took away mining fees, which like that EIP, sorry to like go on a tangent here. Like that EIP right there shows you how much. Uh, in, in my opinion, how much the ETH community hates mining. It's like, you hate this thing so much that like the entire Ethereum 2.0, like, I don't know if you guys know what the difficulty bomb is, but like the difficulty bomb is basically, yeah, Lawrence is nodding his head. It's a, it's, it's a thing that is going to mark Ethereum's transition to proof of stake. Once it goes off, Ethereum's difficulty will continue to uh, increase until it becomes impossible to win block. And so like all of Ethereum's moves towards proof of stake are done with the mind to kneecap the mining uh, industry or the mining sector, to make sure that they do not want to do it, which is totally screwed, but they're still doing it, which is so funny, right? Because it's just, it's just so much money in it. And so Luxor, we launched an ETH pool recently and everyone was like, why are you doing that? Proof of stake is coming around the corner. And we were like, we don't think it's gonna come for a while. And like a few weeks later, the Ethereum community like the Ethereum Foundation put out that thing where it's like, we're not calling it ETH 2.0 anymore. It's like, we're calling it like the execution layer and the activation layer is some like complete, just like gobbledygook. But um, yeah, um, I, I think the most, uh, I think the Intel probably will just stick to Bitcoin mining for now because the future for uh, proof of work on Ethereum and other altcoins is just so sketchy. Yeah, I, I was. I remember reading up on the East 2.0. Like, so I remember, I don't know, maybe two years ago, spending a lot of time like trying to understand uh, like the different like I was it was uh, Casper the like ghost options or whatever. <laughs> right. I kind of went to that. And, and I spent a lot of time like reading up on it, and I even wrote like a blog post on it at the time, like because I was just interested to try and understand what the two proposals were or the two right. main proposals were, and then where they went. They went for like a hybrid of the two, and then they were this was their plan for 2.0. And then, so I understood it to quite a good degree. So then I, I then realized that what they had been doing and what they were doing wasn't really seemingly making much of a difference. So it seemed like as it, the, the time frame was going to be dragged out a lot. And then obviously, Vitalik essentially kind of admitted that, didn't he? And that basically, oh yeah, we're trying, but it's kind of taking a lot longer than we thought it would. And actually it's not yep. going to make that much difference with speed. So I think you're right. Like it seems like it's going to take a, a number of years until we get anywhere near this like ETH 2.0. If we do. I, 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 yeah, actually, I don't even know if it's ever going to happen. I mean, I, yeah. I, don't th- I don't think it's coming. I don't think yeah. it's coming. Like over the past three, four years, like Ethereum community has had over like, at least five different names for different, you know, skin solutions. They've been, you know, Raiden Network, Sharding, you know, Sharding is coming. Uh, you know, now they just, you know, they basically just um, pitched their forks with um, the tenth with um, 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 L2s, you know, Polygon and the side chains, basically. So all this talk about Sharding, uh, uh, the um, Raiden Network, I think Raiden Network has a token now where it's, you know, totally gone to shit. And we just keep hearing these, you know, futuristic terms, you know, to keep, keep sucking in people into, you know, gambling DeFi and stuff like that, you know, just to keep the whole, you know, 
uh, Ethereum ecosystem interesting enough for people to actually come in, you know, get dog eat names and become, you know, as cringe as forgive me, but um, uh, what, what's the dude's name? The, uh, is it Adam from Bank of the Future? Forgive me, but that dude is so very cringe to actually, you know, read his tweets. And, you know, he just kept dot eat names and started you know, babbling the state the comments so you know annoying on twitter so i think yeah i think it doesn't make any sense for companies to actually start you know uh developing plans futuristic plans around something that is not very reliable bitcoin is, is actually reliable and that is one of the you know that is one of the the pros of actually you know building on bitcoin or you know having to deal with bitcoin I would agree with that. I feel like Bitcoin just has legitimacy that the other coins don't. Like Ethereum is the closest one. But like even that, like Ethereum, uh, very few miners are mining Ethereum on the scale that they're mining Bitcoin. Like Hive and um, Hive and HUD8 are some of the largest ones that are doing it on an industrial scale. But most of them, like you said, like to your point, Jerry, most of them aren't doing it because it's just, there's too much uncertainty. So like you're not going to invest like hundreds of millions, tens of millions of dollars into these machines, right? You, a long time ago, when I interviewed you for Living on Crypto in the USA, you said that you felt that custodial lightning wallets were going to play a larger role. And now we see in El Salvador with the legal tender law, Chivo being a custodial wallet, Bitcoin Beach being a custodial wallet. Um, I just wanted to get your input on it. Oh, man. Yeah. Chivo has been such a, such a hassle, right? Such a shit show. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of been an, I'm interesting to see that thesis play out. I totally forgot that I had made that prediction. Um, but I mean, Strike's another good example, right? I mean, Strike is completely custodial. And it's kind of like, you know, they try to market it as something different. And it is. It's unlike any other wallet or tool we've had. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, the Chiba thing is particularly unfortunate because it was like El Salvador's like chance to like really be like, hey, like we're making you dot Bitcoin, but don't worry, it's going to be cool, bro. And they just completely fumbled it. They screwed the pooch. Um, so I hope that that incentivizes, the good thing about it is that I hope that it incentivizes education and people to like actually use the good, to like the good third-party wallets, you know, that exist, which is really confusing to me. I don't know why El Salvador didn't just do that in the first place. Like there are dozens of good developers out there that it could make them an amazing wallet, but they didn't do that. So hopefully people will start using those. Fingers crossed um all right well yeah but dude thanks for for joining us it's been uh much appreciated i uh always a pleasure chatting with you um is there any sort of final uh words or any plugs you want to want to do before you head out uh yeah i guess i'll plug hash rate index um follow hash rate index on twitter follow luxor uh on twitter not the casino luxor mining um luxor tech team is our, te our handle and uh you can find me at as i lay hodling on twitter and yeah, uh, Lawrence, uh, Ricardo, Jerry, thanks so much for having me on. Always enjoyed chatting with you guys. Oh, and uh, check out BitRefill. BitRefill is awesome. I use it on the weekly. Uh, sometimes I treat myself to some DoorDash. It's amazing. Thank you, guys. Much appreciate it, man. It's been good. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, thanks, Ricardo and Jerry, for joining me. And uh, thank you for all of the listeners out there for listening and having a great time. Uh, as always, uh, have an amazing day week month year uh have a lovely time and keep buying bitcoin and keep being happy take care